thank you so much. Uh, actually, this talk is aimed for, well, well, there's a kind of a prerequisite that you know what JavaScript is, but that's pretty much it. So everything is kind of easily digestible here. So yeah, welcome to the last talk of today. I hope everybody's still awake and not thirsting for the after parties already. Uh, well, my slides are going ahead of me, but today we are talking about moving towards greater dev ex developer experiences through the use of web, web platform APIs. That's a mouthful for you guys to say at the after party and try to say it three times fast. Uh, I got 109 slides, so we're gonna go quite fast here. Uh, I'm Matthias Huhta, I go by the alias Matsu in pretty much everywhere in the internet, Mastodon, Twitter, Slack, everywhere, GitHub mostly. I am a senior software developer at Simpler, that's a small software consultancy in Turku. I'm a quite a passionate web platform enthusiast. I like to talk about using the actual web platform instead of uh, proprietary tooling. And I do a lot of open source work and talks around that subject. I'm also a avid home brewer, not the type that types into the console brew install, but the type that actually makes beer. I don't have any here with me because I came from Turku, but if you want some, you can just find me on Twitter and ask for some, I might mail it to you. Uh, you're starting a new project. How many of you start a new project? <laughs> yes, perfect. I think it's recess now, so if everybody wants to play dodgeball outside, I'm fine with that. Foursquare is all right, okay. Is that the last one? Yes, thank you. I can actually continue with the talk. So, uh, how many here with a show of hands actually starts their project with a just a NPM in it? Not many, not many. <laughs> it's like the, we, the world has changed into using NPM create React app or NPM create WordPress app or whatever, PHP composer, whatever you use for building your stacks. But if you write this into your console, you are only left with pretty much a one file. You have your package JSON, it doesn't have much in it, it doesn't have like any runnable code, you're just left at your own devices. But after just a couple of lines of code, you can just like put your HTML files up, you can create a small hello world with a printing into your DOM, because printing into consoles is boring, it's so much more fun to actually touch the DOM, and when we have that small bit of JavaScript code, we have our hello world for actually printing onto our screen. And if I was half as cool as ha some of the people here, this is the time I would be adding jQuery to, to my project. But since it's 2023, the web has evolved quite a bit. We don't need jQuery anymore. We are quite pretty much have all of those features in our web APIs through, well, the most popular features like Ajax through the fetch API. Curious selectors through actually curious selectors and so on and so forth. But if you in nowadays this web apply just a little bit of elbow crease into your starter project that we just looked at, we are able to replicate some of the features that are in today's uh, JavaScript frameworks like React View or Svelte, for example. So with this small uh, bit of JavaScript code and some custom HTML, we are able to create, for example, a component that evaluates expressions and returns the uh, math expressions result to our screen. Running evil is always fine. Do it on production. Uh, actually run. Don't run evil on your JavaScript code, but it's just an example of a component. If we take a little bit of a look of the element itself. I don't know why my slides are changing sometimes, but let's just go on with it. Uh, if you look at the element itself, we can see kind of a familiar structure if you've ever worked with a component framework. If you look just, just closely enough, it might look like something like view, because it's a single file component. You saw HTML, you saw JavaScript, you saw styles in the actual JavaScript file. But where's the imports? If it's view, where's the view imports? If it's React, where's the view React imports? Well, strap yourselves in because we are gonna take a whole ride <laughs> through the actual web platform APIs of today and how you can create these like killer features that are present in all of these libraries we use but without actually using these libraries and without actually burdening your mind with all of the complexity they bring with you. 
So a small table of contents of today's talk. We are going to be talking about productivity because we want to be productive, we have deadlines to hit. We want to be talking about developer experience. And lastly, if we have time, when we have time, it's the last talk, I can keep you here as long as I want to. <laughs> we will talk about some exciting, cool stuff. Uh, one of the things that you already saw a little bit was the web platform APIs that pretty much I'm most known for uh, advocating for, which is custom elements. They're a native API, so they are shipped in pretty much every browser nowadays, IE 11 isn't a browser, but every browser that is actually a browser, it has 100% support across the stack. So it, whether it's an Apple device, it's a Linux device, it's a Windows device, Chrome, Mozilla, Chromium, WebKit, whatever, it's supported in all of the platforms. It's reusable, so you can create elements that are actually reusable, so you don't have to be repeating yourself. Sorry, the slides are escaping me. And you can pretty much jam these into any project you are currently using. Custom elements are built on a couple of different web APIs. There's Shadow DOM, there's ES modules, there's HTML templates. It's a whole nother talk if we went there, but if you want to know, there are just web standards that are implemented by all the vendors and agreed upon by all the vendors. So there are some, there are stuff that it's not going, going to change from under. It's, it's not a library that's going to be deleted someday. It's a feature built into all of the browsers through all of these APIs. But that's enough babbling about APIs because we actually want to see some real code and some real examples. So let's get into our first topic, which is productivity. While, while I could be using native APIs completely to uh, exam do these examples for you, uh, it would be quite difficult to read through those. Uh, hold on. Yes, they are escaping me again. Uh, it would be quite difficult to read and also it would take like uh, so much size from the screen that we wouldn't be able to read it. That's why we are applying a small helper library to help us. In this case, we are using a library called lit. Who, who here knows about lit? Can I get a show of hands? A couple of hands. Well, lit is a uh, helper library for developing web components. It's uh, pro produced by Google developers, so it's backed by a big company and it's used pretty much all over the internet from Mozilla's backend sites to well, YouTube soon, so it's adopted everywhere. And if we take a look at our file, the actual important part on, on this file that we want to pay, pay, focus on is here, the, the actual import, because if we just import this library into our project like this, well, we are of course going to get trouble because we cannot be using import statements outside of a module. What is a module? Pretty much for developers, all you have to know now is that a module is a script that is imported with the type module. Magic, all in a day's work and you have all of your imports working. And now if we take a look at our evaluator again, which we rewrote in lit, we have the same evaluator on our page here. But that's enough fiddling around with just raw JavaScript evaluation because nobody wants to see me evaluating JavaScript for 30 minutes, so let's get into the actual meat and potatoes of these things. But first, a quick question to the crowd. Uh, who here wants to be the very best? Like no one ever was. And you guys are welcome for the earworm for the whole rest of the day. If Pokemon went through your mind, it's fine because we are going to be building a Pokedex here today. We want to be building a website that lists all of our Pokemon. It gets all of the Pokemon a individual element on the page and it can show some extra information of our, on our Pokemon. We will skip forward in time a little bit because you don't want to see me writing all CSS and HTML and JavaScript to actually make the API work and everything. So we will move on a little bit. We have a small piece of code here. We have a call that is abstracted into another file that just calls the Pokemon API and it returns just a JSON array that we can iterate through. Then we have our rendering system. If, if anybody has ever written a functional React component, it should look really similar. It's just a function that returns HTML and it gets evaluated into a DOM. And then we have a pokemons.map function which maps through the array and returns a Pokemon list entry named element onto our page. 
And it looks like this in action. And it's powered by the technology we went through, which is web components. We will take a peek inside what the actual component and see what it actually does and how it can be quite familiar for anybody who has written any component uh, component uh, systems or any any kind with with any kind of a front end component system so first we have our initialization of our properties we tell the properties as type we tell, tell what the property does and we tell the initial values of those then we have our uh, life cycle we have our first up updated which is just when we arrive into the dom what do we want to do well we want to put some event listeners so we can actually be dynamic. It's not 2005 anymore. We want dynamic web experiences. Then we have our rendering function, which is just a function that returns HTML. Nothing special about that. Uh, then we have some event handling in our component. We can add event listeners into our HTML through just at click, which is really familiar for anybody who has written view or pretty much any modern uh, component library systems. And then we can just attach JavaScript functions to those elements. And what the outcome will look like is not something you, you might be familiar with. with. With frameworks like, well, again, React and Vue and everything, in those, those frameworks you are rendering divs, you are rendering spans, you are rendering buttons, and you are rendering all of these native HTML5 elements. But when you are using custom elements, the name already tells it to you. You can create your own custom HTML elements. So you can create any kind of an element as long as its name has a dash. So for example, if we wanted to embed to our site a WordPress schedule, Word, WordCamp schedule, we could just create an element called word-camp-schedule and just like put it onto the DOM and it would be rendering it if it has any backing JavaScript. There's a couple of details in here that we will go into shortly, but to take take home from here is to just that it's just plain old HTML, nothing special about it. Backed by plain old JavaScript, nothing special about it. We didn't bundle it, we shipped it through the browser, we could have written all of this in the developer console of a browser if we wanted to. And what is really fun about these components is that you can actually just sprinkle them onto any of your projects because we are not relying on any kind of a build process. We are not relying on any kind of a, well, we are rel relying on a small library, but we can also get that from a CDN. So we are not relying on pretty much any kind of a toolkit to ship this feature. But we get into a problem when we are creating these elements because we have to be writing some duplicate styling. We have some styling on our main.css, which styles our actual web page. And then we have some styling on our web component because web components use encapsulated styling, which what that means is that if you write styles inside of your component, it won't escape to the actual parent DOM. And if you write styles in your parent DOM, it won't escape into the actual component. So it's fully encapsulated into its own island there. And we can see the cutoff point here. So in the actual HTML element of Pokemon list entry, we can it, it it will be affected by global styling because it's in the light DOM, so or like the regular DOM that you are used to. But then there's the shadow root in between, and shadow roots are something that you might have seen in, for example, iframes or uh, embeds or inputs if you enable certain developer flags. All of those have some shadow root contents installed inside of them. And what the shadow root does is pretty much acts as a boundary between your components insights and the actual site it's embedded into. And it will not let any of the styling interfere with the outside world, and it won't let any of the styling from the outside world interfere with it. There's other small features that come with it, but we won't be going into those because we have 50, 50 or so more slides to go. But we want to be putting these styles into a format that we don't have to be repeating them. There's a lot of overlap between them. We want to have them in one place so we don't have to be updating 50 different places if we decide to uh, change our design systems, for example. Well, somebody of you might be thinking, yeah, let's just put the CSS in JS because we can just, it's JS in the web component side, so we can just handle it in the JS side. But th that kind of opens up a whole can of worms because 
first, firstly, CSS is evaluated in the browser before JS, so you will have this flickering effect when somebody arrives on your page. Second, if you have some like long-running JS process, processes on your page load, it might cause even longer of a flick, flicker. And also, your styles shouldn't be dependent on JavaScript. They should be dependent on style sheets. That's what they were designed for. We are going to be talking about something that's not CSS in JS, it's CSS imports in JS. This might be something a lot of you haven't heard about yet because this is a really greenfield feature. This is something you can only use in Chromium currently, but other browser renders are shipping it soon. But what it means in action is that we can actually do this. Some of you, if you have ever used a building system, you might have used something like this. You have imported some CSS into your JavaScript, but it's not a native feature until now. You can assert that it's CSS and the browser will evaluate it and create a CSS stylesheet object for you. What that gives us is we can just use the same styles we have in our main.css or whatever.css file and use it as a JavaScript object in that, that way. In action, it only means that we can import it and we can just add it to our styles object and we have all of the styles from the main.css in here appended inside of our shadow root. And we, we can share those styles between the actual uh, components if we wanted to, or the actual light DOM and the shadow DOM, respectfully. And as a recap for the productivity, uh, we will be going into some of these subjects deeper in the later sections, but don't repeat yourself. So right principles are really something that people have fought with for years, like the first, first first like server rendering frameworks and everything was created so you don't have to be copying your HTML files and copying the contents of your HTML files into other HTML files. That's why we had languages like PHP and everything just prop up and so you can share, off, share those sub pages and actually like render reusable parts of pages. Well, components are doing that for us now. We are can create reusable components onto our page, whether it's a button, whether it's a section, whether it's a whole whole page, we can create those inside of our web components or custom elements and just sprinkle them onto any page we want. And also sharing styles, while not yet completely supported by all browser renders, it's something that is going to be supported in the coming years, I hope. But moving forward, we will be talking about my favorite subject on the internet, which is developer experience. Uh, how can we make developing these experiences fun? Like we went through a lot of technology and, so, and, and a lot of code and it kind of might have looked like a lot, lot of pitfalls in the code. Like there might have been some stuff you were pointing at like, yeah, that's not gonna work or is that really the best way to do it? Well, we will look at those, some of those in, in the next section. For example, our first gripe is that the library we are using, we were using through a CDN. We were importing it directly from a CDN, which has a whole whole variety of problems. For example, our code editor doesn't know about this because our code editor hopefully isn't going to be calling the internet and asking what this actual uh, URL resolves to. On top of that, we are relying on an external service. And on top of that, it's just icky, in my opinion. So let's fix that. Let's in install the library into our local system with just our regular old package manager. I use npm, you can use yarn or pnpm or even bun nowadays with its release of 1.0. And then we can just change our import statement on our file and voila, our code editor is already happy with it because it can give us extra information about our code because it can give us completion hints, it can give us documentation about the code. Hopefully if the library author has written documentation, please write documentation. And, and then we can just take a look at our app and huh, something went wrong here. If we take a look at our console, we get a familiar error if anybody has tried like just writing imports from a tutorial onto a browser and running it without a dedicated development server. Usually this is resolved by development servers actually like fetching the files from imports like this, but 
since we are just writing HTML, we are just writing JavaScript, we don't have those fancy things like that. And what could we do to combat this? It's, it's a cumbersome, we had a good run, GG's everybody, we have to go home now and just like ditch all of this developer experience we had here. And some of, some, some of your teammates might be approaching you like, yes, let's just add a bundler onto our project, let's add Webpack and everybody will be happy. <sighs> Said no one in the last five years. Uh, usually this is the approach everybody takes, a development server like Vite or a bundler like Rollup or Webpack or Parcel or whatever you want to use, there's so many I can't keep counts. But that brings us into another conundrum where we are having fun and bundlers are bringing complexity and they are not on the same side of the scale. And if anybody has ever re 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 read Grugbrain Developer, it's a caveman stories of a developer. You should be reading them, they are great, but complexity is the eternal enemy and even the caveman Grug would prefer fighting a T-Rex instead of fighting complexity because he at, at least he can see the T-Rex. You cannot see the complexity that you are adding into a project. So let's dodge getting the headache of our project and let's try to find another solution. We are still staring at, our, at the error on our page and we are not having a good time. Until some, somebody come, approaches and tells us about import maps. How many here have heard of import maps? Can I get a show of hands? One person, we are really going on the bleeding edge here. This is a feature that is currently shipped by every Greenfield browser, and this is something that might be changing a lot of use approach to bundling, for example. So what import maps are in general is just a JSON object that allows us as developers to tell the browser how to resolve these module imports we saw. For example, we saw the import something something from lit. That's a module import. And to activate this feature, we are not going into JavaScript. We are going into the HTML. We are going into the HTML and adding just a small script tag. Earlier we saw a script tag with the type module, which, which let us create a JavaScript module for our page. Here we are creating a script tag with the type import map. And what, what we tell it is when you are resolving a module and you see the name lit in the module, resolve it into this address. And as soon as we add this onto our page, we didn't do anything else, the problem is gone. We have our sweet, sweet, po sweet, sweet Pokemon rendering again. We are happy because we can see all of these happy faces, familiar faces again. And what this does in action is just tell where to find the import and when to, where to actually resolve this. And you don't have to go into the internet to do this. You can also just resolve this into a local address. Whether it's a mo node module, whether it's a, a local package library, whatever it is, as long as it's JavaScript, it's fine by the browser and it's fine by me. And it might cause some problems because you are not only importing that. The modules are importing other modules and they are importing other modules, so you might be running into a problem with, with all of those imports coming into play. So you might be wanting to actually stay with the uh, importing the CDN version of it. And you still get the developer experience of your installed dependency, but you can still ship the site onto the internet and have the same site visible on the internet without any kind of problems. So we went through a couple of framework features here. We went through, as I promised, we are building framework features without frameworks. We went through the components. We can handle components through the Web Components API. We went through dry, don't repeat yourself, through the components and the CS module. So we had to only write once and use it pretty much anywhere. We went through package management. We don't need package managers or bundlers. We don't need the complexity because we can use something like import maps if we need to have dependencies in our projects. But the last thing everybody's raving about nowadays is we want strong typing. JavaScript is not a strongly typed language, and so we need extra tools. For example, we have this code here. We are just printing values from a uh, array and trying to get, get them done. But we are not getting them done because that's not valid JavaScript. 
I wish we had a bug hunter to work with. So we add a small file into our project. It's called a JS config. Anybody who worked with TypeScript knows a TS config. This is just a TS config with some presets set, set onto it. And as soon as we add it, we can get our code editor actually reporting these errors to us. And we can generate JavaScript documentation for, our, for these uh, elements. It's pretty much the same as writing TypeScript types, but it's for JavaScript. And our editor is already happier with what we are doing. And it's already telling us we have errors in our code. We can get errors visible on our editor by just adding the small JavaScript documentation onto our function. And then we can actually fix the error in our typing and then find the actual place that caused the error because we are actually documenting the types of our file. And if you don't want to rely on your actual code editor giving you the type, uh, type checks, you can also put it into your CI with the TypeScript compiler with just a no emit flag so it won't be emitting any extra JavaScript. So I'm trying to wrap this up fast. We have the framework features up, we have the components, we have the drive, we have the package management, and we have the strong typing. Yay, we have all of the developer experience stuff we wanted set up here. Then we go to the exciting cool stuff if we have some time. Uh, currently, our page, if we get the internet, it's loading. Yes, our page looks like this. It's the listing and it's opening our Pokemon into the small Pokedex-ish thing. I'm not a CSS developer, don't, don't judge me. We want to make it actually pop out. We want to use something called Weave Transitions. Weave Transitions is an API that was shipped just now that will allow us to create these seamless transitions without actually creating all of this complexity into our project. So where we are rendering our spa views, so single page views, we can just wrap it in a start view transition function. And if we wrap it into the function and add some small CSS into our project, we can already see, uh, let's see if the video loads, we can already see those two small things. We're able to create all of this dynamic switching between views there was no other stuff added to the code, only the start, rent, start, start, start view transition, and then we just marked two objects on our DOM with the same class and same view transition name. We can go deeper in that, but we won't be going in deeper into that. Also with import maps, you can create something like a dynamic import map, so if you want to have your development experience and your production ex experience a bit different, you can just write your import maps in JavaScript and then just have them work dynamically, or you can just, you know, YOLO and create the worst load balancer ever. And also, this is a cool thing for teachers. If anybody here teaches JavaScript, you don't have to be going into tool chains. You don't have to learn NPM and bundlers and everything to actually get started. You can just put a couple of import maps into the starter HTML file and have the actual students writing actual code instead of fighting with NPM. And like I said, the browsers are really becoming more and more powerful every day. We have stuff like uh, browsers being able to access HID devices. So you can configure your keyboards on the browser if you want to. You can map your keys to do anything in the browser itself. And you know what else is a HID device? This thing right here. It's a Wii remote. So if it's attachable to the browser, it's programmable. So instead of actually clicking here, I could have just <laughs> swung my slides away. This is just 100, 100 lines of JavaScript added to the Google Slides page. And who wouldn't want to do this all day? I'm already exhausted, it's a workout here. But yeah, that's all for me. Thank you so much, Workout Finland. These are my socials, if you want to call them socials, you can find me there. I'll be at the after party, you can find me there. Have a great day.